Continuing with the poem Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Let us look at stanzas 19 to 31 Once again I will not read through the text You can take a look at it for yourself And we will go directly to the explanation of these lines Some history trivia for you. Before electricity, light came from oil lamps. As the lamp burned, the wick would darken and be used up, causing the flame to become low and dim. But you have to say lamp is not a lamp. You have to say that it is a lamp. You have to say that it is a lamp. You have to say that it is a lamp. डाला हुआ होता है जलने की वजह से वो कपड़े का ऊपर का सिरा खराब हो जाता है जिसको समय समय पर काटना पड़ता है दैट इन इंग्लिश इज नोन एज विक बत्ती को इंग्लिश में विक कहते हैं ट्रिमिंग द विक इन्वॉल्व एक्चुअली कटिंग द बर्न एंड ऑफ एंड फीडिंग अ लिटिल मोर ऑफ द क्लीन अनबर्न विक अप आउट ऑफ द ऑयल the flame would then burn brighter and higher as it does here in Christabel's room. Once the lamp burns brighter, Geraldine catches a clear look at the angel carving. In the swinging light, the angel looks more lifelike. Geraldine, being a creature of the night, finds this extremely unnerving and sinks down to the floor in fear. Christabel mistakes Geraldine's fear of the holy statue for weariness, means tiredness. She offers Geraldine a wine infused with wildflowers, meant to calm the nerves and soothe nightmares and other fears. Christabel's mother made the wine herself. Geraldine asks if Christabel's mother will be as kind and caring as Christabel has been. Knowing what we know of Geraldine so far, it seems more likely that she is assessing her victim's situation. Or as they say in old detective movies, she is casing the joint. Christabel re reveals that her mother died giving birth to her. The friar means the priest who came to give Christabel's mother her last rites was also the one who heard her mother's last words. Those last words were that she would be around in spirit until she hears the bells ringing on Christabel's wedding day. For the record, bells are rung at a wedding to ward off evil spirits. Christabel's mother wished nothing but good things for her daughter, even though it was her daughter's birth that ended up killing her. Unfortunately, that wasn't terribly unusual at the time. In other words, many women died in childbirth in those days. Christabel says that she wishes her mom were there with her now. Geraldine also says that she wishes Christabel's mother were with her. Okay, it's frankly a bit of a surprise that Geraldine would wish anything pleasant for someone she has only deceived so far. Now we are starting to see Geraldine's true colours. Her voice changes and she appears to be shooing away the ghost of Christabel's mother. Geraldine claims that she has the power to make the ghost go away. She tells the ghost to peak and pine, which means to become weak and wither away. This is line 205. Here again the speaker is toying with the reader, giving us hints and trying to steer us away from the truth all at once. <clears throat>
check out our speaker section for more on this he or she wonders why if geraldine can see ghosts she would tell such a ghost to go away at the same time we know perfectly well why geraldine would be telling a good spirit to take a hike because we have been picking up the creepy vampire vibes that coleridge has been laying down all along christopher's mother said she would be the girl's guardian spirit until the day she marries but geraldine is taking a claim on christopher now now we know for sure that christopher giving geraldine her hand and helping her across the threshold were both very bad decisions Christabel is either incredibly naive meaning innocent or under a powerful spell she believes that geraldine has been driven a little crazy by her ordeal with the men and white horses so she tries to comfort her geraldine has worked up a sweat driving christabel's guardian angel away she tells christabel that it's over now Christabel thinks that she means that her madness caused by her ordeal meaning her difficult the difficulty she has been in was only temporary what geraldine really means though is that she has successfully driven away the ghost who was trying to protect the girl geraldine has some more of the wine and appears to be feeling much better now no longer frightened of the image of the angel above the lamp and now free of the protective spirit of christabel's mother geraldine gets up from the floor geraldine is tall and lovely but in an exotic way like a lady from a country far away geraldine tells christabel that the angels adore her and that she is holy and protected by them she also notes that the feeling is completely mutual between christabel and the angels geraldine then says that she will repay christabel for all the kindness she has been shown we are not sure whether to trust geraldine here or not is she being purposely ambiguous ambiguous means vague not very clear does she really mean well even after all the evidence we have seen that geraldine may be some kind of dangerous supernatural creature perhaps geraldine believes that whatever she has planned for christabel truly is a reward it looks like these things are getting a little sexy again when geraldine asks christabel to get undressed Geraldine says that she must pray before joining Christabel in bed. Considering how she behaved when she saw the angel statue earlier, this scene begs the question for exactly whom Geraldine will be praying to. Christabel's head is filled with thoughts, both good uh, addressed by the word weal and bad by the word woe in the text. so she is having a hard time getting to sleep this is line 239 it's possible that christabel's thoughts of weal and woe weren't about her betrothed means about her fiance but instead about geraldine if coleridge intended this to be about woman on woman seduction then he is being subtle about it means he is only hinting at it at this point at least until the next line when she starts gawking means staring at the other woman remember we are talking about christabel here christabel starts staring at geraldine since she can't sleep she decides to sit up propping her head up on her elbow to watch geraldine as she prays Yes this is definitely one of those awkward parts we can practically hear 
the Barry White being played in the background of the stanza as Geraldine undresses seductively in the lamplight. Geraldine drops her robes and reveals her naked self to Christabel, who is still watching. The rolling of her eyes is a bit odd though and hardly erotic at all. Perhaps Geraldine wasn't praying so much as allowing herself to be possessed of some kind of demon, that is, she invited some devil to enter her body or spirit. At the time the poem was written, just as in the time in which it is set, a lesbian tryst would have been extremely taboo, if not a punishable offence. It has been said, however, that the Victorians had a voracious sexual appetite, that is, they were sexually very hungry, that was often reflected in their literature. And this racy scene is just the tip of the Victorian iceberg. Even if the scene didn't involve two women, the scene would still be shocking. Since Christabel is a virgin, and betrothed to someone else. Premarital sex was a big no-no and doubly so when it was with someone other than the person she was engaged to. Not much has changed when it comes to that latter department, even today. The last line in stanza 28 begs whatever good spirits may still be around to protect poor Christabel from the evil thoughts that she is likely having and also from whatever it is that Geraldine has planned. Things are really heating up now and we don't just mean in a sexy way. It appears that Geraldine is having second thoughts about what she has set out to do. She hesitates as she stands there naked and speechless looking at Christabel as if to find a reason to change her mind. Assay means attempt. So clearly, Geraldine is troubled by her plan and tries to push away her doubts. Line 259 Geraldine apparently succeeds in convincing herself to commit the sin she has set out to commit. She slips into bed with Christabel wrapping her in her, in her arms like a lover. Ah, well a day is a lamentation much like woe is me. If we could see the speaker of the poem, he would most definitely have thrown his hand up to his forehead in a dramatic fashion. Geraldine now whispers to Christabel that the act they are indulging in is shameful and the cause of much woe. Woe means sorrow. She continues to say that neither of them will speak of what they are doing and that Christabel will simply tell everyone the story of finding Geraldine behind the tree and then bringing her into safety. It's mostly the truth, just, you know, leaving out the naughty bits. Now, it's difficult to say whether Geraldine is weaving a literal spell over Christabel or if she simply means that the sex is like a spell. We have suspected all along that Geraldine is a witch or a vampire, which can be understood as churel. So the spell might be the real deal. However, if sex weren't a powerful thing all on its own, then musicians wouldn't have much to sing about, movies wouldn't have much to show us, and Match.com probably wouldn't exist at all. Once again, we will just have to keep moving through the poem to try to understand what is going on here. Christabel the conclusion to part 1, stanzas 32 to 36. We'll skip the text, read it on your own and come directly 
to the explanation which goes something like this in the first stanza of part 1's conclusion coleridge has decided to give us a quick recap the speaker paints a beautiful picture of cristobal just before geraldine comes on the scene cristobal kneels at the tree in sentimental and loving memory of her beloved knight who is off somewhere being knightly she cuts a lovely innocent figure there in the dark spooky means frightening forest honestly the descriptions are on the melodramatic side even for a victorian poem but there is a reason for this melodrama by painting cristobal in such a bright light the darkness that is about to befall her becomes all the more dark and sinister means threatening in comparison the skipper skips all the stuff in the middle to bring us up to the hanky panky that is going on in cristobal's bedroom the speaker is taking an active part in the poem here in the conclusion he speaks directly to us as if he were peeping at the scene in real time and relaying the events to us as they happen this speaker's views of the event is what makes this section so judgmental the speaker's voice is emul emulating in a way copying or repeating what the reader is expected to be thinking so the speaker claims that he was dreaming or at least he must have been dreaming for such a terrible thing to happen to such a lovely young innocent lady there is that viz word again line 294 remember that it means believe which again tells us that the speaker believes or just wants to believe that he didn't actually witness what he witnessed he wants to deny that the lady in bed with geraldine is really sweet cristobal whom he saw praying so sweetly at the tree before all of this happened the last few lines point out just how shameful geraldine is because she sleeps so peacefully it is important to note that we the readers don't really know what happened we can certainly make some assumptions based on the sexiness of the last stanza in part 1 and on just how offended the narrator is in this section offended means annoyed but we don't know for sure what happened geraldine is seen as a mother with her child perhaps a metaphor for an experienced woman who has initiated meaning introduced an innocent into her world of lustful activities Geraldine held Cristobal in her spell for the entire witching hour while the knight held its breath and the speaker held his breath and waited while whatever deed Geraldine had in mind was done now the owls and other creatures of the night are starting to stir again whatever spell Geraldine held over Cristobal <clears throat> has ended Cristobal rolls over and goes to sleep now but she is crying is she remorseful about what has happened or is she relieved to have expressed her true self it seems that cristobal has mixed feelings about whatever she and geraldine did because she cries but then sometimes she smiles too we will never truly know what was going on in coleridge's mind when he wrote this poem but it seems impossible not to see some of the poet's own personal issues 
reflected in this work. His addiction to laudanum, which was a type of uh, drug, for example, was much like the picture drawn here of Lady Christabel and her dark hour with Geraldine. Perhaps the speaker's struggle with the situation is the poet's attempt to work out his own struggles and shame. Check out speaker for more on that. Line 324 is particularly interesting since blood so free could be a metaphor for sexual freedom. Now, feminism and the women's movements are still decades away from when the first part of Christabel was written. But that does not mean that the topic wasn't being bounced around. Coleridge was particularly close to William Wordsworth whose work, both professionally and personally, often attempted, attempted to address marginalized people in society, in other words, women. So it is possible that Coleridge may have picked up some of these ideas. This isn't to say that Christabel is in any way a feminist poem, but simply that the ideas of feminism were beginning to bubble up in society and these things can sometimes sneak through the cracks. The last few lines of the concluding stanza remind both the reader and poor Christabel that the angels will always be there to help anyone who asks for help. The question is whether Christabel feels that she needs salvation or not. We will find out in the morning. The conclusion to part one. The poem returns to the image of Christabel in prayer at the oak tree. An unnamed and unspecified first person speaker then describes the way she is sleeping with her eyes open and seems to be dreaming about something frightful. The speaker notes that the cause of the bad dream is the one who is holding Christabel in her arms as a mother holds her child. Christabel pulls herself out of her trance and weeps. The speaker wonders what if her guardian spirit is here and what if Christabel knows her mother is nearby. The speaker then adds that Christabel does know that saints will aid if men will call. Next is the glossary of Coleridge's poems. Now remember that these words, the list in, uh, these are not words which are used in the text of the poem. These are just words which are associated with the poems of Coleridge. Bard, capricious, sedan, cincture, this is there in the text. Conversational poem, dulcimer, aeolian, genial, grove, luminous, lyric poem, mastiff, again used in the poem, melancholy, nightingale, ode, palfrey, romanticism, palfrey again was used in the poem, sonnet, speaker, vaunted, etc. We will continue with more other aspects of the poem in the next session. Thank you.